Okay, hi everyone. This is going to be the second lecture for chapter six. So we are picking things up with below the line deductions. And the idea with this is you're generally going to pick the greater of your itemized deductions or your standard deduction, right? And the idea, right, is your itemized deductions, right, there's going to be like A, B, C, D, right? You add them all together. Maybe that's, I don't know, let's just say 12 grand. You compare that with your standard deduction, 14 grand, right? Well, the winner, the bigger of the two, generally that's what you're going to pick. What we're learning about here, right, in the second half is what are A, B, C, D, right? What are these itemized deductions? As well as what are some of the modifications to the standard deduction? And then we'll look briefly at the end at uh, the QBI deduction. But for purposes of itemized deductions, you can remember them through this COMMIT acronym. So C-I-M-I, or I'm sorry, C-O-M-I-T. Or it could be like COMMIT, right, or COMMIT, either way, right, simple way. So you have charity, other itemized deductions, medical, interest, and taxes. And when we cover these, right, we're not going to cover it in this exact order. That's just a way for you to memorize it. But let's start here with medical expenses, right? So the idea with this is uh, you get a deduction for qualifying medical expenses in excess of 7.5% of your AGI. So that's a mouthful. Let's unpack that. What are qualifying medical expenses? Well, those are expenses for you, your spouse, or your dependents. And the thing is, they have to be out of pocket. In other words, you've got to back out what insurance covered. So it's like truly what you paid. Now in this framework, the expenses themselves, they can be things like prescriptions, transportation to the doctor, long-term care facilities, health insurance premiums. What they don't include, however, is cosmetic surgery and over-the-counter medication. So hey, you get um, you know, some type of plastic surgery, sorry, not a qualified medical expense. You buy uh, Tylenol at the grocery store, right in the uh, kind of medicine section. You don't get a medicine or a uh, medical expense. So uh, afterwards, once you establish your qualifying medical expenses, namely those out-of-pocket expenses, then you got to back out 7.5% of your AGI, right? So here's the idea, right? You have 100 grand of AGI. Right, just to keep it simple, the first 7.5% or $7,500 is going to act as a floor. Right, and what we mean by that is hey, we calculated, we did step one right here, and we said, hey, you have, I don't know, $13,000. Right, so the ideal with that is you don't get the entire 13. You only get the excess right up here above that floor. So that's step two. So if you're looking at you know, how do I do this? Step one, qualifying medical expenses minus reimbursements. Step two, you're going to take step one minus 7.5% of your AGI. So let's look at some examples here. Right, we have a taxpayer, they have three grand in expenses. Looks like insurance pays 1840. All of these are good expenses, they count. We're gonna back out the uh, amount, right? Well, it looks like they really paid 1160, right? That's gonna be step one. This one's just showing you that mileage, you know, hey, that could count. This one shows that, hey, you're gonna have to prorate uh, you know, your usage here. And this one is kind of showing us step two, right? So let's say that when we did step one, we calculated $2,400, okay? Then they're telling us, hey, you have an AGI of 187, right? So we have 187 right here, right? We got to figure out what's 7.5% of that, compare that with our uh, you know, step one and see what's going on. Well, in the first scenario, right, 7.5% is roughly 14,000. We're at 2,000. Sorry, you don't get any 
medical expenses here. In other words, we don't clear this floor. We're like baby level down here. In distinction, right, if we had $20,000 of AGI with that $2,400 of qualifying medical expenses, 7.5% is 1,500. Hey, we do have an excess amount, right? There's our AGI, 7.5%, right? We clear that floor and we get the deduction up there for $900. All right, next one. Uh, you can take a deduction for your state, local, and foreign income taxes. Uh, it also includes your real estate taxes and then your personal property taxes. Note, uh, if your state doesn't have state and local sales tax, uh, you, or I'm sorry, if your state does not have income tax, so state income tax, so like Texas, for example, doesn't have this, you can deduct sales tax instead, right? So here's the big thing with it, however, right? It's limited to $10,000. So let's look at 614 here, right? We have a person, hey, they paid some income tax, they paid property taxes, you know, in total, they're paying uh, 10,380, but they're limited to 10 grand. So that's the idea with the itemized deduction for state and local taxes, right? That's great, uh, but we're really going to cap you at 10 grand. And like I said, this was a big reason why people used to itemize. You know, it's very like likely if you own a, a big house or something like that, you could be paying 10 or $20,000 a year in property taxes you could be paying ten or twenty thousand dollars a year in state income taxes. Hey, I got forty grand that I used to be able to get a full itemized deduction for. Now you're capping me at ten grand. So this was kind of a contentious item when they did tax reform. All right, next one: interest paid basically to buy, build, or improve your first or second residence. Hey, you can get a deduction for that interest. And depending on, you know, when you took out the loan, there's different thresholds here. The idea with this is, right, when you pay your monthly mortgage, right, say it's a thousand bucks, some of that is going towards your principal and some is going towards your interest. There's various other items in there like property taxes, things like that. But uh, to the extent you pay mortgage interest subject to those thresholds, you can look at 615, you can get an itemized deduction for it. Another type of interest, right? So the first one was called acquisition indebtedness to acquire, um, you know, a property, your first or second property. The second one is called investment interest. And the idea with this is you borrow money, you then uh, use the money that you borrowed to go buy investments. Like I buy stock, I buy bonds, right? Something like that. Um, the idea with this is on that borrowing, you're going to pay interest, right? Now, as I have here, right, the deduction for interest paid is going to be limited to the tax taxpayer's net investment income, namely their interest income minus their interest expenses. So the excess is going to be carried forward to the future year. So a simple example here, if you have $200 of investment interest you paid, but you only have $100 of net investment income, then hey, you're only going to get a $100 deduction. You're limited to that net investment income. Likewise, be aware you don't get any deductions for credit card interest for like personal use credit cards, uh, generally personal use items or personal use expenses, no deduction. All right, next item here, charity, right? So if you make... Uh, donations to a qualified charity, you can potentially get an itemized deduction. First thing is it has to be a qualified charity, right? These are traditionally 501c3s. Um, so it could be like to the Goodwill, to the Salvation Army, to a church, right? To the United Way. There's you know, plenty of charities out there. One thing that doesn't count, political contributions and personal gifts. Right, you donate to the Trump campaign, you donate to the Biden campaign, don't get a charity deduction for that. Likewise, uh, you go and you find a homeless guy on the street and you give him $20, no charity deduction, right? That's that's a personal gift. Similar setup there for like a GoFundMe, 
right? If you donate to somebody's GoFundMe, that's basically a personal gift. You're not donating to a charity, right? You're giving a personal gift to somebody else. So we're going to look here, we're going to quantify charity, right? So we kind of have three steps, right? What are we giving? How much is it? And then are we going to cap it, right? Is there a subject uh, to a threshold here? So we're going to start with money, right? We'll look at money, then we'll look at property. So we're going up, we're looking at money. The general rule is going to be fair market value. So in other words, if you give money to a charity, right, it's going to be deductible in the year that it's paid or charged for the amount of the donation, right? So, hey, I charge my credit card. There you go. I want to give to the charity. Hey, I give you cash. I write the check deductible in that year. A few things here. Right. You can get a deduction for you know driving uh, to a charity, right, using your vehicle in a charitable purpose. Uh, however, there is no deduction for the fair market value of personal services provided to a charity. So, hey, you do the books and records for your church. You say, hey, if I did those books and records for a business, I'd charge them two grand. So I should get a deduction, you know, two grand for doing my church's books and records. Sorry, right? No deduction for personal services that you give to a charity. The other thing here is it has to be for the net donation, right? So say that you see the Shriners commercial on TV, right? You give them a hundred bucks, right? And they give you that adorable teddy bear blanket, right? It's the teddy bear, right? And they say, this thing's worth, tw you know, is worth $20, the idea for this is you only get the deduction for 80, right? You only get the deduction for the net amount. You've got to back out anything you receive. Okay, so that was property. Generally, when we're quantifying it, it's going to be the fair market value. If we're talking about property, right, you need to distinguish capital gain property from ordinary income property. And the big thing here, it's generally going to be the one-year mark. If you held it for more than one year, it's going to be long-term capital gain property. If you held it for less than one year, it's going to be short-term capital gain property. And the thing is, you want it to be long-term in theory because you get preferential tax rates, right? Like 0, 15, or 20% on the gain. Whereas in distinction, short-term capital gains are taxed as ordinary income. It's just like W-2 income up to potentially 37%, right? So would you rather pay 37 or like 0%, okay? So that's the first thing. You have to distinguish the property I'm giving, right? The property, it can be stock, it can be a car, it can be a chair, right? It, it's like property. It's basically anything other than cash and that's not services. So uh, if we are doing, right, property, we're going to start with anything that's capital gain property, right? And that's going to be defined as uh, any appreciated that asset that would have ge <coughs> generated a long-term capital gain. So you're in this area right here. The general rule for that long-term capital gain property, you held it for more than a year, is that you're going to use the fair market value of the property. So, okay, here's an example, right? You got Apple stock. You bought it for $20, the adjusted basis. And uh, right now it's worth $300, right? That's the fair market value. You held it for more than a year, right? You give this to a charity, you're gonna get a deduction for the fair market value, right? That's the idea there with it. Um, now, there is an exception to this rule, right? The general rule is right here, but we do have an exception, right? And the exception says, if you donate tangible personal property, right? So instead of giving a stock, right? Maybe you give a chair, maybe you give a painting, right? Maybe you give, um, I don't know, a car, right? It's tangible and it's personal property. And if you're aware at the time of the donation that uh, the charity is going to use this in a way unrelated to its charitable mission, then you use the adjusted basis, right? So here's an example that's in the book, right? The idea is they give a painting, right? So the idea here is um, there's a painting 
And let's just say the person who's donating it, they paid an adjusted basis of $50 and its fair market value is, I don't know, $200, okay? So the idea with this is, let's say, and, and let's say it's long-term, right? It's a long-term capital gain. If you were to give this painting, for example, to the church, right? And you said, hey, church, this is a religious painting. I know you're going to hang it up on the wall and you're going to use, um, you know, in your, the mission for which you're a church, then we'll go fair market value, right? General rule. However, right? If this painting, right, this was, um, you know, something the church, like it's a, just the normal painting, right? It's like a, um, I don't know, a Leonardo da Vinci painting or something, right? And you know, this church, they're not going to use it, right? As soon as they get it, they're going to sell it, right? Well, what you're donating is tangible personal property. And you are aware at the time of the donation that the church is going to use it in a way unrelated to its charitable mission. In that way, you use the, the exception, right? The adjusted basis would be the amount of the donation. Okay, so that's this guy right here. Long-term capital gain property, general rule, fair market value, but we got the exception for the adjusted basis. All right, ordinary income property, right? So here we're looking at generally short-term capital gain property. You held it for less than a year. Well, in this case, right, the amount when we're trying to quantify the charitable contribution is going to be the lesser of the fair market value or the adjusted basis. So if we had that Apple stock, right, again, let's just say you paid $20, the adjusted basis, and it's worth $200, right? And let's say that you've held it for one month, right? You're like right here. So if you sold this thing, right, it would generate uh, and be ordinary income. The idea with this is because it's ordinary income property, it's a short-term capital gain, you've only held it for one month, we're going to pick the lower of the adjusted basis or the fair market value to quantify the charitable contribution. So in this case, the smaller of 20 or 200, hey, it's 20. All right. Next thing here, be aware there are there is a ceiling on the amount of charitable contributions that you can deduct. In other words, it's not like infinity uh, on it. And I'm not going to you know belabor this on the exam or anything, so don't get uh, bogged up in this 621. Just be aware, as a general rule, right? If you're giving to a public charity like a 501c3, most of the time for most people it's 60 percent right, cash. So if you have um, $100,000 of AGI, right, 100 grand, 60%, the first 60, right, you get a deduction for that amount of charitable contributions. If you give above beyond that, right, that's not going to, you know, you're not going to get it in the current year. You have to carry it forward. So just be aware, charitable contributions, they are uh, capped at the amount you can get. All right, continuing, right, casualty losses. The idea with this is the only time you can get a deduction for a casualty loss is when it's from a federally declared disaster. And a casualty loss is when essentially there's like a catastrophic loss, like your house gets struck by lightning, there's a tornado, somebody steals your car, right? If it happens from a federally declared disaster, like the president says, we declare this a disaster federally, then you can get a deduction for it. If, however, right, it's just a run of the mill, you were, I don't know, somebody, your grandma was smoking in bed and the cigarette fell over and she caught the house on fire, you do not get a deduction for that because it didn't come from a uh, federally declared disaster. All right, next one, and we've talked about this before, so I'm going to just touch on it high level. Gambling losses. Remember, you got to report your winnings and your losses separately, right? And your losses are an itemized deduction, and they're limited to your winnings, right? So if you have 
um, you know, uh, $100 in winnings, but you have $300 in losses, you only get a deduction for $100 as an itemized deduction. And again, if you take the standard deduction, which like 95% of people do, you don't get uh, any of the loss deductions. So we've looked at this before. The next form, right, this is Schedule A. Just be aware, Schedule A, right, this is where they list out all the itemized deductions, right? They add them together. You compare that. This is the idea of uh, the form where you put these items. You calculate that commit. This is where you would do it on the tax return. All right, so let's move a little bit to the standard deduction. So we said generally, right, for most people, if you're single, you're looking at a flat $14,000. And as a general rule, right, you're gonna pick the greater of your standard deduction or your itemized deductions. This can be modified, the 14,000, right? In other words, it can be bigger or it can be smaller. So if you are old or blind, right? You're 65 plus or blind, you get an additional $1,850 for each of those criteria. So let's just say we have a 67 year old. They're looking at something like a $16,000 standard deduction. Right, we tack that on top, the extra 1800. I'm just rounding it up to keep it simple. The second exception, and this is from uh, applicable to, to many of you, right? If your parents claim you as a dependent, is that for individuals who are claimed as a dependent of another taxpayer, so mom and dad hypothetically claim you, your standard deduction is going to be the greater of, right? So you got to pick the bigger of $1,250 or $400 plus your earned income, right? So you kind of add these together, but when you add them together, it's capped at the standard deduction. So it's not like $400 plus 20,000, right? If you get that high, they're gonna just cap you, you get the regular standard deduction. What's the upshot of this, right? Um, if you, for example, don't work and mom and dad claim you and you go to do your tax return, your standard deduction is going to be $1,250. They basically give you a baby standard deduction. You barely get anything. Um, and again, the reason for this is you're being claimed as a dependent. They kind of build that into mom and dad that goes into things like when they get the child tax credit, things like that. But let's look at some uh, problems here for this uh, second item, 623 and 624. Okay, so we have a dependent son. Looks like they earned $600 cutting grass. They want to know what is the standard deduction, right? So this is a kid. He's being claimed by mom and dad. We got to pick the bigger of, right, $1,250 or $400 plus the earned income, right? I'm just going to do that now to kind of keep it simple here. So in this case, right, it's like $1,250 versus $1,000. The bigger is $1,250, right? There we go. That's the winner. The next one says, assume the same facts, except son earns $2,100, right? So we got to pick the bigger of, right? The 1250 or those two added together. Well, in this case, right, you add them together. It's 2,500 bucks. Oh, the bigger a 1250 or 2,500, 2,500, okay? Let's look at one more scenario. Son earns 14 thousand dollars right so it's going to be the bigger of right 1250 or those two added together you add them together right it's 14 400 here's the problem right we've exceeded the standard deduction here right once this gets too big right we're capped at the normal standard deduction so even though we calculated 14 4 it's really $13,850 because we're capped, right? So the bigger of $12.50 or the capped amount, you know, $13,850, all right? 
Next thing, be aware, right, of itemizing deductions. So what does this mean? Uh, you know, the bunching of them. So here's kind of the setup, right? You kind of are going to bunch them or put them all into one year. It helps you overall. So um, let's let's say, for example, and this is the general rule, right? The general rule is you're going to pick the bigger of your standard deduction or your itemized deductions, right? You do that every year. Sometimes, right, you're like just barely close, right? You're barely picking it, right? Maybe that's 14 and this is 13. That's 14 and this is, you know, 12. What you do, right, is to the extent you have control over these guys, you just cancel them out, pay them in the current year, right? Then you'll be at 25. You'll pick 25 here. You'll pick 14 here. That 20 or no, 39, right? 25 plus 14. If you bunch, right, your total deductions between the two years is greater than if you just did 14 and 14, right? 28, no bunching. So that's the idea to the extent, and you don't have control over all of these deductions. Some of them you can do it, right? Like maybe all of these deductions are charitable contributions and you give you know, 13 grand this year and you plan on giving 12 grand next year. Well, you might be better off just giving 25 in the current year because when we look over the two year period, you'll be in a better overall position. You will have taken 39,000 instead of 28,000 you know, standard deduction, standard deduction. All right, last item here, the QBI deduction. So just be aware of this. What is it? So essentially, when they did tax reform in 2017, they put the tax rate for the corporations at a flat 21%. The owners of like partnerships and S-corps and sole proprietors, they were kind of mad, right? They were like, what's my benefit? So to kind of compensate them and you know hear them out, they made this QBI deduction. And the idea with it is it's a 20% deduction for flow through income or generally like a self-employment income if you're a, a Schedule C taxpayer. But there's a lot of teeth to this and it's really complicated. There's a lot of ways where you can get phased out on it. You can make too much income. You can have too much this, right? There's, it's very, you know, complicated with it. That's why we're you know, just going over at high level and in an advanced class, you would look at it. But you get the QBI deduction. Again, this is in addition to on top of the standard or itemized deduction, right? So it's like get standard deduction versus itemized. You know, pick the bigger, usually the standard deduction plus you get the QBI deduction, okay? So what is QBI? This is essentially you know, flow through income. So here's kind of the idea, right? Maybe we have a partnership. It has a hundred grand of income. You're a one fourth partner, right? You get 25,000 pushed out to you, right? In theory, right? You'll report 25,000 of income, but because this is qualified business income, you'll get a deduction for 20% of that amount, right? So maybe you'll only end up having, I don't know, something like 17,000, right? Whatever 20% of that after you back it out is. But again, be aware that there are, you know, a lot of, um, you know, mechanics and teeth to this. For purposes of like an entry level tax course, just know it exists. Do not get caught up in the book on uh, the complex calculations on it. But with that, we're going to end this here.